Just a little warning as we get into this video, if you are trying your best to keep away from leaks, uh, kind of the topic I want to talk about today is based on a fairly well-known oldish one. Uh, so turn off the video if you don't want that to be ruined for you around about now. So today, guys, I wanted to talk a little bit about the ultimate destination we know the story will be going in with the next expansion and a kind of cool puzzly riddly little thing that's come from that that uh, I find really fun to think about in terms of the lore at the moment so we can obviously do a lot of speculation already about maybe the next living world episode or even the one after that the maps that we might go to the story threads that they might pick up and so forth but I've kind of got my mind on a bigger prize on something a little bit more distant further still and that is of course the next as yet unnamed unreleased expansion so the previous expansion for the game did take us to one specific region that was the uh, Maguma jungle and most of it was localized to that place it seems that probably the next expansion will do something similar taking us to a new region and staging most of its story and content there so this is the leak and it's uh, quite old now a lot of us are well aware of it there was a screenshot posted from a bit back suggesting that that location for the expansion was going to be none other than the Crystal Desert. And particularly one of the areas, at least from that, the Amnoon Oasis was going to be returning. And who knows, maybe in addition to the Crystal Desert, there'll be somewhere else. Maybe we'll even get parts of Alona, we're not entirely sure. But I definitely do think that the Crystal Desert is, let's say it, on the table. So that's cool, that's very exciting. The Crystal Desert is such a badass place, guys. It's probably one of my favorite game, like, desert locales I've ever been to. Just because the original Guild Wars 1 devs, when they implemented it, had a lot of respect for the sheer variety you can offer someone in a desert landscape. Like, a lot of games will just throw sand dunes everywhere, and that will be it. But no, not in Guild Wars 1. In Guild Wars 1, we had uh, desolate plains, and we had salt flats, and we had mesa-type areas. And yes, we had the sand dune-type areas, and we had the oasis and the classic stuff but it was littered around a lot of other types of deserts and it was awesome and it was so magical and it took place in a really cool area of the story too where it was kind of quiet and secluded from the rest of the world and we were escaping from a conflict only to be thrust back into it later there was a magic to the place it was fantastic and it's one of those places I have desperately wanted to go to in Guild Wars 2 for a long time Guild Wars 2 has a much greater capability to present its environments to us so who the hell wouldn't want to go there but here's the fun thing and this is what I've been thinking about a lot recently. Let's assume we definitely are going to the deserts. How does that tie in to the existing game? You know, when this leak first came out, this wasn't such an interesting riddle, but there is a suggestion now that what if we only get like six episodes for season three and then they announce the expansion and we get to go there, right? What if we only have eight episodes for season three? We're already halfway through, guys. And here's the funny thing. At nothing in season three so far has there been any reference or any slight remote understanding of anything that would push us towards the Crystal Desert. Or well, nothing super overt anyway. And I actually really like that. It's like a bit of a puzzle. It reminds me of what you see sometimes on good TV where they mess about with the narrative, you know, and they show you the end. Uh, and then it becomes a question of how you get there, but nothing seems to make sense on that journey. So I want to I wanna talk about this a little bit for you guys today. Let's look at the dead ends first, all right? Let's break this puzzle down. Let's look at the current stories that they're showing us in Season 3. And hopefully I can establish to you what, uh, what I mean by this. So, uh, first, where's a good place to start? Well, the Head of the Snake, we did have a lot of stuff to do with the Crichton Civil War. We had a lot of stuff to do with the White Mantle. We had uh, Confessor Cordicus's death and all of that good stuff. What the hell has that got to do with the Crystal Desert? It was a great story, but it really has no ties, right? You guys see what I mean? In fact, if anything, the White Mantle are kind of like the opposite of the desert to me in a great many respects. When you look back at Guild Wars 1, the reason, as I say, we went to the Crystal Desert was to hide from the mantle. The mantle didn't follow us there. They didn't go there. There were no humans. There was very little presence of real intelligent life on the desert because it was such a harsh and inhospitable landscape. So we kind of receded away there to get away from the mantle. So, you know, so much of season three has been dealing with white mantle, white mantle, white mantle, and I've loved that. It's just, what has this got to do with the Crystal Desert? It doesn't seem like it's ever really going to transition into the Crystal Desert. And yet the next expansion might be there? Uh, let's look at another current story that's going on. Um, let's look at the Shiver Peaks, right? Let's look at the old, much-loved story we had in uh, A Crack in the Ice with Bram, right? Love him or hate him. What's the story? It's Bram rallying the Norn against Jormag. 
Your mag's not in the desert. In fact, again, this is like the complete opposite of the desert. If we follow this story to its logical conclusion, what's going to happen is Bram's going to grab a bunch of Norn and he's going to march them north, further away from the desert. In fact, so far away, it's the sh far Shiver Peaks. It's like one of the furthest away locations we can possibly be on the current world map from the desert. How the hell does that end up linking into any of this? Well, the answer is it just really doesn't. Either this story has to accelerate and finish before the next expansion in potentially just like four updates or less, or it's just not going to resolve by the next by the time the next X back comes out. That's kind of a curious idea, right? That our characters might be split all over the globe when it comes. Um, moving on, we've got uh, another story. We've got Primordus Awakening. Now, you guys know what I uh, what I think about Primordus. He's amazing. He's probably my favorite Elder Dragon of them all, depending on how and if they ever deal with the Deep Sea Dragon. Primordus is badass, and the Fire Island Chain is badass. It's wonderful that we got to explore there again. And Timey's plan to pit the two Elder Dragons of Fire and Ice against one another is also badass. But what does that have to do with the desert? Nothing, really. The closest you can do here is suggest that Timey's plan might succeed, which, for what it's worth, I'm not too confident it will, uh, that her plan might succeed, both Elder Dragons would die, and then Kraukatorik gets stronger and, you know, enters the threat, the fray. But here's the funny thing about that, right? Because then the idea is we'd go to the desert to combat Kraukatorik. If that were a thing, wouldn't it be more reasonable to think that Kraukatorik would leave the desert to find the site of the other two slain Elder Dragons to absorb their mag magic? In which case, even if Kraukatorik becomes a threat, there's ample opportunity for it again to be written such that we never have to go to the deserts. Uh, and then there's lots of other minor stories, right? We've got like Ritlock, okay? Ritlock has been recalled to the Black Citadel. Well, Ascalon is the nearest territory, one of the nearest territories to the desert, sure, and that's Char territory, sure. But why would that have to have anything to do with the desert? That seems like a real struggle to think that, that could be related. Uh, what about Logan? Logan's going to become the head of the pact, right? Um, and he could be blighted. In fact, I'm a big believer that there might be some kind of condition damage guardian elite spec coming up and it will be to do with Logan's blighting from the pods. That's a wonderful, cool story, but what's it got to do with the desert, right? Unless we, again, maybe fab fabricate some weird situation where Logan, as the head of the pact, decides to march along the scavenger's causeway to clear out undead that were alluded to in current events. Then we've got the current events, right? We've got the regrowing of Khaled Bog. What's it got to do with the desert? We've got potential Aether Blades and timey-wimey time travel stuff going on. Again, nothing necessarily to do with the desert. And then finally, we've got Lazarus, okay? We've got Marjorie, we've got Lazarus, and again, nothing particularly over there. I prefer the idea of Lazarus going north to the Isles of Janthir or to the Verdant Cascades and checking stuff out there. And so you can see, hopefully, that pretty much everything they're doing doesn't make any sense for where the expansion might go. And I find this fun. So I thought today I would give you guys a couple of the more subtle reasons that we may end up going there and hopefully open up a little bit of a dialogue so you guys can get your comments going down there, how they're going to do it. Because obviously the, the great worry here is we don't want the devs to essentially shoehorn this in at the last moment. Uh, for one thing I will say about season two, for all of its faults, for all of its um, strengths, I think season two did very well at showing us exactly where the story was going. When that exp uh, expansion trailer dropped, showing us the jungle, it made perfect sense that we would be going to the jungle because of everything that they'd established with Morgamoth at the end of Season 2 and where the Morgam were coming from and where the maps had slowly been leading us to. Season 3 hasn't done any of that. You know, by the time of Episode 4 in Season 2, you could probably get the gist. You can't. This time we're going all over the place and following a ton of different stories. So that could end up biting us in the ass if they don't deal with it well. Or it could, uh, it could be really, really awesome. So, uh, what are my theories about why we might end up in the desert. Um, and I think for what it's worth, out of the three or four things I'm about to tell you, it would be coolest if it wasn't just one of them, but it was some odd combination. So what are the story threads that might go further? Well, number one, first let's talk about the Forgotten. So the Forgotten aren't really, as far as season three is concerned, especially a very overt story thread for Guild Wars 2. They're kind of though, always in the background, and that's why I think that they're going to be quite relevant. So, 
Um, the Forgotten have most recently been very clearly mentioned, I believe, in the Rising Flames patch, where we got to see a little bit of history between them and the Massart. That's kind of an interesting thing for Lazarus, I guess. But uh, why I say the Forgotten is because we knew that the last place on Tyria that this ancient race were hanging around was the Crystal Desert. Back in GW1, we heard great stories about the Forgotten working alongside the gods to foster Tyria and, you know, bring life to it and make Tyria a great place. But as other races rose to prevalence, the Forgotten were pushed back and back and back until eventually they were essentially just hiding out in the Crystal Desert. And they were safe enough in the Crystal Desert because no other intelligent living things could really cut it around there. So as a Guild Wars 1 player, this was the main area you ever saw the Forgotten. That plus places within the mists. And and when we come 250 years forward in time to Guild Wars 2, did they ever give us a story about where the Forgotten went to? No! Potentially there are still living Forgotten around, and potentially the reason we don't know about them is because they're still in this incredibly desolate place, the Crystal Desert. And the Forgotten are pretty relevant to a lot of stuff that's been going on. Again, not necessarily so much Living World Season 3, but look at the Exalted, major players in Season 3. These guys were formed by the Forgotten. Look at Tarir, look at everything that's basically going on there in Auric Basin and many of the ruins that we found around the previous expansion. It all ties back to Forgotten lore. Look back to Season 2 of the Living World as well. Look at how that ends in the cave with the mysterious golden influence again drawing back to the Forgotten. And again in Season 2, we even had the Ascension Trial, which we didn't actually become ascended in Season 2, but we did like a mock imitation of a Forgotten Ritual that we know is lying there in wait, right in the Crystal Desert. So all of this stuff, I think, could be one of ArenaNet's best opportunities to bring us to the Crystal Desert, make something big happen with the Forgotten, throw in a real living, breathing, forgotten character towards the end of Season 3, who, who implores us to come to him as a big mystery, cut to black, boom, and now we have the trailer for the expansion rolling, or something like that, I think could be really cool. There's something as well about Lazarus, right? If they set up that there is some history between Forgotten and Massart that's a bit deeper than we've previously known about, it's interesting to me to think that Lazarus, or this imposter Lazarus, may end up wanting to consult with the Forgotten and take us with him. There's something about the way he called Cordicus a snake back at the opening of season three that somehow still gives me chills. If they could call back to that by reintroducing the snake people, oh, that would uh, be wonderful. So that's number one. Uh, next story thread that I think also is a really good opportunity for us to get to the Crystal Desert that wouldn't be too crazy to pick up is, of course, with Ritlock, not necessarily the fact that Ritlock's been called back to the Black Citadel, though this could be a part of it, but more specifically, Ritlock's time in the mists. The mystery that I think we were all hoping to be answered back in Heart of Thorns is probably a mystery I'm expecting to be answered either right at the end of Season 3 or in the next expansion itself. So we're more than familiar with the big theory about this, right? Ritlock went to the mists, and when he came out, he was blind. So there's a suggestion here that he may have met with the human human gods. Well, let's not also forget that the Forgotten, as I mentioned a second ago, were there were numerous numbers of them in the various realms of the gods. And also let's not forget what his main influence as a Re revenant seems to be after he came out of the mists. And it's not that he channels a lot of Maliks or, or Jarlis necessarily, who it seems that Ritlock met in the mists, if not just the gods, or even the gods at all, it's Glint. Glint seems to be the big character and Glint of course has also like many of the Forgotten who worked with her got a lot of influence on this story right now. Don't forget for those of you who have read the books specifically the second book Ritlock Brimstone living breathing Ritlock Brimstone knew Glint met with her consulted with her spoke with her forged a battle plan with her they were friends and so it would make a really interesting story if Ritlock went to the mists after his failed attempt to get rid of the ghost in Ascalon, wandered around, maybe he met Rurik, maybe he met the gods, maybe he did any number of things, but meets Glint, and Glint gives him a lot of really detailed, juicy, awesome information that now, at some point in the very near future, he will decide that he has to act on. And where does that bring him? To the site of Glint's death in the Crystal Desert.
and that could make a lot of sense as well. I think that'd be pretty cool. Obviously, Logan is now the leader of the pact, but I do still uh, very much like the idea of Ritlock banding all the members of Destiny's Edge together to sort of avenge their failure in the past and the death of Snap and the death of Glint herself and, and actually take Krakatorik out. The question is, how does the story maneuver itself into a place where Krakatorik's a great target instead of these other two much more active Elder Dragons? But I want to see that. I want to see Ritlock's valiant charge straight into the Crystal Desert. Moving on, number three, and this is a very uh, sort of similar area of the story I'm about to talk about. We have Gleam. Okay, so what could it have been that Glint told Ritlock about? Well, it could have been about her other surviving offspring, no. Uh, speaking of big reveals, this could be a huge, huge, huge thing for us. Uh, you guys, those who have been watching a lot of me on the channel, you should know about a couple of these theories. There is a definite idea out there that maybe it was Glint's first child, the first Scion, who gave the Master of Peace the egg, which eventually has fallen into the Exalted's custody, which eventually has hatched into Aurene. And there could be a really cool story here where now that Aurene is perhaps hitting adolescence. We're uh, going to the desert with Aurene to, again, find that site of Glint's body and perhaps interact with the first Scion. I think that would be really interesting as well, especially if somehow the uh, Massart Lazarus has a stake in that. And last of all, last but not least, the fourth idea, and again, you see how all of these could kind of be related in the end. They're all bubbling under the story and they could very quickly roll to the top the other big reason we may end up going here for the expansion is to do with Timey's plan. So, Timey's plan currently is to pit fire and ice elder dragons against one another and hope that they annihilate one another. My current theory actually is that this won't work. And what we're going to see is actually one of those dragons come out of the fight supercharged. And I really hope it's Primordus. I feel like Primordus should be a really big threat. It also just makes a lot of sense. Fire melts ice, right? Fire wins, surely. Uh, so I like the idea of Primordus absolutely destroying Jormag. And now Primordus is the, like this ridiculous force for us to reckon with. And it forces us to uh, look into other avenues of opportunity, including going to the Crystal Deserts, maybe to consult with Krakatoric or something. That could be kind of interesting. But I think that's going to be the big finale of Season 3. It's going to be those two dragons fighting. And I think it's going to be Timey being wrong. And then that's what gets us somehow angled towards the Crystal Desert. It's just a bit of a riddle as to how exactly we do that. Do you guys have any other really good ideas? I think this is a great topic. It's an interesting thing to think about. I find myself mulling over it probably more than anything else with the lore these days. And every time we get another release, look out for this, guys. Next time they do a Living World release, presumably quite shortly too, think about the fact that the season is going into its later stages now and we still have so little indication about why we might be going where it seems we're going. I think it's fascinating. Thanks very much for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed a bit of Geek Out session today. Hopefully, I've got many more for you coming up. Uh, I'd love to see what you guys have to say in the comments. Thanks very much for watching, and I will see you next time. Catch you later, everybody. Look how ridiculous this build is! Right, but basically, we could target the guy behind our main target. And you'll double the potency. You're suddenly doing 40k damage, right? Because, you know, in terms of cleaving, as far as parasitic contagion is concerned, that's all coming back as heals for you. So as a necromancer, not only do you obviously get the deathly chill combo, but taking curses is kind of ridiculous too, just because of this. And it will make any situation you have in personal story or when you're running around, it will make sustain a, a, a question of the past just because of this. Further, you can compound that effect with Epidemic. One of my favorite little things to do, one of my little uh, combos to make on this,